Museum of Asian Art. My name is Ru Fan. I'm a volunteer docent at the museum. I'm hosting the Zoom meeting tonight. We are very happy to have you join our presentation today. We have many participants today. Please mute your microphone during the presentation. Also, please put your questions and comments in the chat. We will monitor them and they will be discussed at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Now the organizer of this program, Mr. William Coben, will introduce today's program and the presenter. Thank you, Rue. And I'm so pleased to welcome all of you and so glad you could join us. Uh, do let us know in the chat box where in the world you're joining us from. I'm welcoming you from the Freer House in Detroit, the headquarters of the Merrill Palmer Skillman Institute of Wayne State University. This historic building is the original residence of Charles Lang Freer and his extraordinary art collection, which is housed today at the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. We are so delighted to co-sponsor tonight's event with the docent program at the Freer and Sackler Galleries, National Museum of Asian Art, Smithsonian Institution. And I especially wish to thank Paul Ruther, the manager of the docent program, and Ru Fan, a volunteer docent who is hosting the tech production for this evening, and my colleague, Cheryl Deep, who's co-hosting the tech production for our program tonight. And I'm especially thrilled and pleased to introduce our docent and guide for our tour tonight of Freer in Egypt, Gretchen Welch, who's joining us from her home in Virginia. Gretchen is, uh, became an active docent with the Freer and Sackler Galleries after her retirement from a long and successful career in the Foreign Service with postings in Asia and the Middle East, as well as Egypt. To fulfill her passion for the arts of Asia and the Islamic world, Gretchen pursued a postgraduate diploma in the arts of Asia at the University of London in 2015. To fulfill her passion for the arts of Asia and the Islamic world, she developed a tour on showing her love of Egypt and inspired by research done by curators at the Freer and Sacra Galleries. And we are going to enjoy that online tour of Egypt tonight. In recognition of Freer's Detroit and Michigan roots, she has added some local highlights to further enrich our experience and our tour. Gretchen, it's been such a pleasure to work with you on this joint program this evening and I hope it's just the start of strengthening the historical ties between Freer's legacy in Detroit, in Washington, and around the world. And now I'd like to welcome our docent and guide for exploring Freer's travels in Egypt this evening, Gretchen Welch. Good evening, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be with you. I'm gonna ask my colleague, Rue, if she can stop sharing her screen so I can start sharing mine, thank you. And while I'm getting this set up, it's a particular pleasure for me to be joining many of you in the Detroit area. My mom is uh, born and raised in Detroit, graduate of the University of Michigan, 1952. Um, we spend many, spent many a great holiday with our cousins uh, all over the state of Michigan. So I feel a special affinity for all of you. And I sure hope it's warmer than the last time I was in Ann Arbor because it was really cold. <laughs> so as Rue and William said, it's my real pleasure to welcome you to this virtual program. It's a, a tour, so to speak, from the National Museum of Asian Art. And as you all well know, tonight we're going to talk about Charles Langfrier and the items he collected in and from Egypt. Um, as just a bit of a background on our virtual tour program, the docent program at the National Museum of Asian Art at the Freer Sackler began offering virtual tours at the start of the pandemic, which is hard to believe it's almost two years ago. Much to our surprise and real pleasure, it's allowed us to reach new audiences like yourselves 
um, who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to visit our museum in person. And it's also allowed us to explore items and topics in our collection that aren't on display. And in the nearly two years since we began offering these virtual tours, we're really pleased we've been able to reach audiences on every continent except Antarctica. So I guess that's a goal for us in the next year. It's, it's really been a lot of fun. For some of you who may have visited the Freer Sackler, I hope this tour brings back some wonderful memories. For the rest of you, we look forward to hosting you in person soon or hosting you on another of our virtual tours. Tonight, we're gonna to focus on items contained in the Freer Gallery of Art. Uh, the Freer Gallery opened in 1923 as the first art gallery on Washington's National Mall. It's part of the Smithsonian Institution and we're really looking forward to celebrating our centennial next year. The building is home to Freer's Asian art collection, primarily Chinese, Japanese, and Korean art, as well as art from the Middle East. Of course, we also have his collection of American art, especially, especially the work of James McNeil Whistler. It also houses two other important elements of Freer's legacy that we'll discuss tonight. The archives, which include Freer's voluminous personal correspondence, his diaries and notes and records of acquisitions, for which we're very grateful, I must say, and a study collection which primarily houses fragments and shards, or pieces of ceramic, of materials from across age Asia, including Egypt. So in this talk tonight, we'll look at the guiding philosophy behind Freer's collecting interests, why he was interested in Egypt, and what he collected there. Freer actually made three trips to Egypt and acquired over 1,500 items made of glass, metal, wood, fans, which is a ceramic material, stone, quartz, parchment, and papyrus. Some of these pieces are amongst the oldest in our collection. The oldest date to 2600 BCE. That's the Old Kingdom, and that's about 4,600 years ago. Now, of the 1,500 pieces he collected, 1,300 are pieces of glass, as well as numerous fragments and shards. But amongst this, these pieces, his, his entirety of his collection, there's some real masterpieces, which we'll shortly see. Here is a, photographer on the, here's a photograph on the screen taken in Freer House in 1909 which shows one of Freer's favorite Egyptian pieces on the right, the head of a pharaoh, head of a man is assumed to be a pharaoh, um, and how Freer displayed it in his home. The photograph shows, to me, shows so much about Freer, what, why, and how he collected and displayed his objects. So I know a lot of you are friends of Freer and know a lot about him, but let's take a quick look at him his life, and his collecting philosophy. 1854, Charles Lang Freer was born in upstate New York in Kingston. One of six children, he left school at the age of 14 to help support his family and went to work in the railroad car, in a railroad car company in the brand new world of railroads in America. Over the course of the next 30 years, Freer helped biz build a business and fortune in this brave new world. Freer's life changed in 1887 when he purchased his first folio of etchings by the American expatriate artist James McNeil Whistler. Whistler lived and worked, as most of you know, for most of his career in Paris and London. Here are two of the 26 etchings and drawings of Whistler's that Freer purchased in 1887. The following year, he purchased 39 more. <laughs> so clearly he had a passion. And note, 
we're seeing early indications of about the kind of collector that was Freer. Buy what you like, focus on a particular artist or genre, and purchase what you can find for a good price. By early 1890, Freer had purchased over 100 of Whistler's etchings and had made a decision to build a comprehensive collection, comprehensive collection of Whistler's work. On a visit to London in March 1890, Freer went by Whistler's house, knocked on the door, and the two became close personal friends and professional colleagues until Whistler's death in 1903. Here is a painting made of Freer by Whistler near the end of Whistler's life. Freer made good on his collection wish, as we all well know, by the time of his death, in 1919, Freer had built one of the world's most comprehensive collection of Whistler's works, which are now held in the Freer Gallery. Included in this collection is the Peacock Room, which we'll see near the end of our tour. It is to Whistler that Freer credited his artistic and collecting interests. Whistler was an early collector in Europe of the arts of Asia, particularly of China and Japan. Whistler was strongly influenced by these arts, particularly Japanese prints. Uh, as many of you know, Japan had just reopened to the world in the 1850s, and Japanese prints were arriving in Europe and having a profound influence on artists like Whistler as well, and, and others like Van Gogh and the Impressionists. Now, this is one of the early paintings Freer purchased of Whistler's, and I want you to take a look at, um, at this composition. This is made from um, Whistler's, from Chelsea, the, um, the side of the Thames in London where Whistler lived looking over at Battersea across the river. But this foreground and the women and uh, how they're dressed is very Asian, right? Look at here, we have these beautiful blossoms. We have a tea set here. The women are, women's gowns are very similar to kimonos. This woman is wearing, a, is holding a fan in her hand. Um, so very strong Asian influences in this painting. Uh, Freer wrote um, later that Whistler represented a decisive fusion of the East and West. For his part, Whistler urged Freer to study Asia and consider acquiring prime examples of the early masterpieces of China and Japan. Freer took Whistler's admonition to heart. After, after orchestrating a, a successful, really almost blockbuster business deal in his mid-40s, Freer retired from active business life and dedicated the rest of his life to assembling his art collection. As you all know, he never married and did not have children, so his collecting became his life's focus. And as someone without a formal education and certainly without any art training, Freer applied himself to learning about Asian art and art collecting. Of course, he undertook extensive travels, some of which we're going to talk about tonight. But in the years while he was focused on building his collection and, it, and traveled, um, his home was and remained in Detroit. Here is the home you, know, you all know so well that he built on Ferry Street in 1892, um, where he displayed his collection, received visitors, studied his works that he'd acquired, examined new shipments. It's an important and integral part of our, it was an important integral part of his life and of our story this evening. This picture, a uh, photograph taken in 1909 was taken in Freer House and shows Freer looking at two of his works. As a connoisseur and, connoisseur and collector, he acquired objects that appeal to his aesthetic sensibility. Basically, he bought items he believed were beautiful. 
As one of his close associates said, Mr. Freer was not a scholar, made no pretense of being one, but his approach to a work of art was to recognize and evaluate quality and beauty. He especially appreciated the formal qualities of color, surface, and texture. And we'll talk about those items a lot tonight when we look at Egypt. Wherever the object's origin um, uh, or, or matter, he felt it was key to have an emotional relationship with a piece of art to be able to re react to its beauty. In this photo, you'll see that he's placed an oil jar right here on the left from Raqqa, Syria, with a Whistler painting of Venus. Now, to some people, they would look and say, these two things have no connection. <laughs> but Freer absolutely disagreed with that. He believed in the universality of the beauty, of beauty and that hit objects in his collection, like these two, were really related to each other by a harmony of composition, color, and technical qualities. As you'll see from the quote on the slide, he really regarded his collections as a harmonious whole. They, con they can constitute a connected series, each having a bearing upon the others. So when we look closely at these two works, an oil jar from Raqqa in Syria from probably the 13th century or so, um, uh, compared to this Whistler pastel, look at the form of the, of the jar and the form of Venus. Very similar, right? The texture on the jar, these uh, uh, horizontal lines, very similar to the lines that appear in the pastel, in the portrait. And you could argue the patina, very similar in some of these places, this brownish, greenish. So um, from different areas, different mediums, but he believed that both were beautiful and complemented each other. Freer really considered himself the guardian of the pieces, uh, uh, the guardian of the pieces in his collection, not the owner. And he thought that the educational value of his collection was extremely important. So in 1904, he decided that his collection was in, of national importance and that he would offer it to the Smithsonian. In 1906, he secured the Smithsonian acceptance of the gift, in which he, and in the gift, was, uh, was included a pledge to provide a substantial sum of money for construction of a fireproof building and to provide uh, the gallery, the museum, with an endowment uh, to support it, which, pleased to stay, we still use to this day. Okay, so we know all this about Freer now. Why did he become interested in Egypt? We know he was looking towards China and Japan to start where Whistler directed him. Well, let's look at some of his early collecting for a clue. Um, by the way, when we look at the pieces on the slides, you'll see this number and letters. The letter F means Freer. And the date is the date in which he acquired it. Um, so this piece was acquired in 1892. It was the second piece he acquired this year, that year. This piece, this year he was quite active. He acquired, he acquired over 400 pieces. Um, so that tells us a little bit about the dates when he purchased these items, just as a little background for you all. Um, so as I mentioned earlier on, Freer loved color, texture and surface. So we had a natural affinity for ceramics. Here are photos of some of the first ceramics he purchased in the early 1890s. And I believe this was the first one he ever acquired. Now note, you know, at the time it was quite vogue to collect Chinese blue and white porcelain. Freer was not interested in that. And you'll see that these objects are in fact quite different, right? They're not perfect in shape or form, quite dynamic in their glazes and colors. Um, Freer loved these kinds of pieces. I think to him, they showed the human element, the human hand in their creation. Now, these pieces are all Japanese. Um, 
uh, or from Japan, but Freer also made earlier purchases of other ceramics. Here are some pieces that he purchased whose origin is China, from China, see, it's 1902 there. See, very similar surfaces, textures, glazes, the color blue he's particularly fond of. He knew these ceramics, he called them Babylonian. You'll see that we attribute them to Iraq now, but for him, they were Babylonian. Again, very similar with a very um, prominent texture. And these purchases from, uh, like very similar to the same area as the oil jar, which we saw earlier, from um, an area that was just being excavated in the early 1900s near Raqqa in Syria. So I hope you can see how similar all these items are. Mr. Freer and these Raqqa items particularly love the iridescence of the glazes and the very interesting patina and decoration on them. Uh, interestingly, in the archives, um, there is a letter that Freer wrote to one of his favorite dealers in 1903. So around the period when he was um, very interested in collecting the Raqqa items. And he basically was saying he's really, he told the dealer he was really not interested in Egyptian items. You know, he said, the Egyptian items are very interesting and I enjoyed studying them very much. I must say, however, that it's a kind of art with which I find myself without the appreciation, which it is probably due. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll see. He changed his mind. Uh, over the next couple of years, and we'll look at why. But while Freer was actively collecting these ceramics from abroad, as many of you well know, he was supporting a local uh, artist, chemist, potter, someone whose work many of you know well, Mary Chase Perry, um, a noted arts and crafts potter who herself was very interested in the secrets of the ancient potters. Perry wanted to produce some of the secrets, as she called it, especially the glazes of, uh, of pottery. And she was especially focused on shape, tone, and ornament. Right up Mr. Freer's alley, right? <laughs> she founded Parabic Pottery in Detroit in 1903. Uh, Parabic, as many of you know, means copper. And uh, it was the name of a mine near where she grew up in uh, Upper Michigan. Unlike Freer, uh, Perry was most definitely a practitioner. And the two have developed what uh, Dr. Brunk, you know, who's written a great book on pubic pottery, said was a really symbiotic relationship. Brunk tells us that in 1904, Freer gave Perry a shard of Babylonian luster and challenged her to replicate the finish. So through Perry's work and her various exp um, experiments, Freer learned the practicalities of ceramics, clay, glazes, firing techniques. And Perry, of course, enjoyed access to Freer's uh, collection and of course from his patronage. And it, you'll see it is, with, it is with respect to glazes that Freer becomes very interested in Egypt and Egyptian ceramics. So we know after Freer retired, he was visiting Europe quite frequently, um, especially London, well, particularly while Whistler was still alive, uh, and Paris. Whistler passed away in 1903. Freer uh, helped plan his funeral, was a pallbearer. Uh, Freer was back in London in 1904 when he bought the Peacock Room. And of course, when he was in London, he visited places like the British Museum. He saw people's private collections. And he became acquainted with the books written by a gentleman named Henry Wallace. Wallace was a painter himself had written two books on Egyptian ceramics, as well as a book on per Persian luster, luster ware, excuse me, all of which we know Freer owned. Now Wallace made a really interesting, um, uh, he posited a really interesting theory 
which was a theory at the time, I think, that Egyptian ceramics were the world's first glazed ceramics. Modern research has shown this to be true. Um, Wallace did these, remember I said Wallace was an artist, these are drawings he made of fragments, ceramic fragments from Egypt, first on the left, and you'll see the portion of the bowl on the right. Um, and um, he re re uh, wrote in his book that ceramic art, given its long history of successful achievement, Egyptian ceramic art exercised and influenced once deep, stimulating and enduring on all the civilizations in which it had had contract, contact. So in other words, perhaps Egypt, Egypt, their discovery of glazes and their use of the color blue, which they also discovered, um, maybe that was the source for glazing as it spread around the world. Freer was really intrigued. Were Egyptian ceramics the beginning? Did they influence those of Mesopotamia and beyond? Perhaps even China? He thought he needed to compare the best art of these cultures and to learn, as he wrote, more accurately their differences, their qualities, and their harmonies. Uh, you'll see here too that Wallace thought fragments and shards were extremely important because you could cut more easily uh, discover the chemical composition, the, you know, the, um, the body, the, the depth of the glaze. So um, he really felt that portions and fragments were important. It turned out, even though Freer said he wasn't interested in collecting Egyptian objects, that he did have two items in his collection. Uh, the first he got in 1902, this small uh, bust of Horus, and then this bowl he acquired in 1905 around the time he was getting quite interested in Egypt and in glazes. So you'll see in his correspondence, he writes to Colonel Frank Hecker, his longtime business partner, neighbor uh, in Detroit, and very close friend. A great question with me now is Egyptian art. Of its pottery of early glazed kind, I must, when possible, secure specimens, if only of the smallest fragments. So in 1906, Freer decided to travel to Egypt. As was his custom, he diligently prepared for his task. He read many books, including the, these are the list of books he took with him. Uh, this is the case he brought to Egypt. Um, and we know he visited and studied the collections of the Louvre and the British Museum. He really thought, he wrote in his notes, that it was possible, as he said, to, to uh, that certain forms and colors of pottery and stone, both glazed and of early Egyptian make, seem to be in certain suggestions, the finest in spirit and the oldest. Now, as you know, Freer was not the only one interested in Egypt at the time. Egypt had become part of the grand tour for, um, for the English. Um, Egyptomania was, uh, was, was quite, quite uh, popular in Europe and America. Uh, I thought this picture of the obelisks in Egypt was, is, is wonderful because as many of you know, um, the ruler of Egypt started giving obelisks gifts and there's one in the Place de la Concorde in Paris. I think there are 14 in Rome. Um, and then, of course, we have our own obelisk, <laughs> our own Washington Monument uh, that we were building in the late 19th century here. Um, interestingly, though, most of the collectors were focused on the Egypt of the pharaohs and the monuments. Uh, there really wasn't much interest in the areas in which Freer was interested. 
So we saw this, this very famous photograph in the slides before we started tonight. Um, Freer took his first trip, um, nearly six weeks long, spent primarily on an extensive tour of Egypt. Um, Freer arrived in the north in Alexandria, traveled all over the country down to what is called Upper Egypt in the south to Abu Simbel. He spent significant time in Cairo, visited the Egyptian Museum, which uh, had opened just a few years before he arrived, uh, the pyramids, Saqqara, and of course, he, he visited several antique dealers. In the photograph here, we see his travel companion, a gentleman named Frederick Mann, a longtime Detroit friend who lived not far from Freer, William tells me, on Cass Avenue. Um, and uh, who was who may or may not have been his personal physician i think that's there seems to be some question about that but certainly a close friend in the photograph here he is freer is sitting here in the middle uh, with cups of tea of course looking at one of his uh is one of the dealers who will feel pro figure prominently in our story ali arabi and this gentleman uh, is a gentleman named ibrahim ali who was kind of freer's they call him a dragoman, which is like a, a translator slash assistant, and who was with Freer, Freer on all three of his visits. So, of course, Freer was based at the best hotel. This is the Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo. Um, it was described as the truly grand establishment of the Victorian period. Guests could enjoy the spectacle of others, often celebrities, royalty, and the very wealthy. Uh, it had been Napoleon's headquarters during his time in Egypt, and after Freer's day, it was the Allied headquarters during uh, both world wars. Freer tells us he had a wonderful time there, and he also, his diaries tell us he ran into some Detroit friends in Egypt, who included a couple named Charles Swift and his wife, Clara. Now, on his trips around the country, Freer acquired photographs taken by a famous French photographer of various areas. Um, interestingly, from other travels, travelers at the time, we know some of the other visitors to Egypt carried a brand new invention that was known as a Kodak Brownie camera. Remember those? <laughs> but Freer appears not to have been interested in either not had a camera or not been interested in taking his own photograph. So he instead purchased photographs made by other photographers uh, of the regions he visited. This gentleman's name is Felix Bonfils, and they're actually quite lovely uh, photographs. So um, what did Queer Freer acquire during his visits? <laughs> well, of course, he acquired some beautiful ceramic pieces. Um, before traveling to Egypt, Freer had learned from Wallace's work about the Egyptian glazed material known as faience. Now, faience was a widely used term for Middle Eastern pottery and ceramics at the time, but in Egypt, it really does have a unique significance. Um, some of you may be potters, you may know about pottery. Generally, potters use a clay base as the primary material in their products. But in Egypt, because of the desert environment there, potters, um, developed a base material that com they, they combined with clay of silica, basically frit or sand. And some of these ceramic pieces are as much as 40% sand um, combined with um, clay or uh, the clay that's found there. So the faience really means, um, in the case of Egypt, a vessel with a significant silica um, uh, composition. So that's why you don't see a super smooth surface on a lot of these items. Now remember the color of this Egyptian, original Egyptian purchase, uh, of his original Egyptian purses? Remember we saw the, the head of Horus and a bowl? Well, here we find it on these beautiful pieces, the blue glaze. Um, which was also similar to some of the, uh, the glazes we saw on the other pieces he purchased. 
again, I think you can see from what we've been talking about why he would like it. The color, texture, and surface are really, uh, I think, quite prominent, quite stunning in these. Um, in ancient Egypt, objects created with fans and covered with this blue glaze were considered magical. Um, as I said, not only did uh, the ancient Egyptians create the first glaze there for a ceramic piece, they're also credited with inventing, inventing the first synthetically produced blue pigment, this beautiful blue. The shiny blue glaze was closely associated with fertility, with life, water, very important in the desert, right? And the gleaming qualities of the sun. Now the silica glaze, if any of you are real experts and I'm I'm getting close to my <laughs> level of expertise here, but it's made with a ground limestone mixed with silica and then a copper-based material, um, sometimes malachite, to, to make the blue. Those were, the, those were the, the ingredients, if that's what you call them. So this kind of bowl, as we see here, uh, with painted fish and lotus flowers, very important ritual objects. Um, in ancient Egypt, lotus, as you know, in many cultures symbolizes rebirth. It did in the same in Egypt. The fish, of course, lives in water, a very important uh, <laughs> me, uh, uh, thing for the Egyptians. And story tells us, uh, stories tell us that the fish, uh, these particular kinds of fish, would hold its eggs in its mouth until they hatch. And then, so it would open its mouth and live fish would swim out of the parent's mouth. So this was seen as sort of magical rebirth. Um, so very auspicious symbols on this uh, bowl. Uh, the New Year's flask on the right also, you know, New Year is always a time of rebirth and regeneration. Um, these flasks were known as New Year's gift because they often carry special inscriptions which uh, invoke uh, the gods to give the owner life, good health. Of course, the color blue is auspicious, fertility, water, new life. Um, so these items were, are, were very popular and uh, found made around the New Year, used in the New Year celebrations. We see the lotus theme again on these very simple earthenware cups. They're, this is uh, something that's called an eggshell cup, because you can see it's very, very thin and fine. Um, lotus and then various plants uh, here on this little cup. This vase has a beautiful glaze, right? Can't you see how Mr. Freer would like that? Just the kind of opaque, iridescent grays that he liked. They're very similar to the some of the Japanese, uh, Chinese, Babylonian pieces I think we saw earlier. We know that he purchased 72 small pieces of these fans, including amulets here. Um, which show the many shades and color in which the fans glazes could be made. Um, he also purchased some shards. Um, so, and these pieces, these amulets were particularly nice, right? This is a very small amulet in the head, the crown of Upper Egypt, a uh, very important symbol. And this pectoral amulet would be worn on the chest in a tomb, depicts the god Anubis, who is the god of mummification, a very important god. Um, so again, the symbol of the blue. Um, and again, you can easily study these pieces for um, all sorts of uh, technical uh, uh, qualities. So Freer was able to acquire these amulets, other specimens of glazed ceramics and stone, mostly Egyptian, but he was quite pleased to get some Syrian and Persian um, uh, uh, pieces, uh, which were, as he said, later of a medieval date. 
we know he purchased this wooden shrine, which is a rare example of a portable shrine that was used by Egyptian priests to carry images of deities in various ceremonies within the temples. Uh, very few examples of this, these kinds of shrines have survived. Um, so it would even, and it would does survive in the desert climate, but uh, fire is a particular problem. And uh, so wood objects are not necessarily as, <laughs> uh, as easy to, uh, uh, they don't, aren't necessarily as well preserved or easy. Um, this has some hieroglyphics and other things on the side. And we have a kneeling king we can see here. This is Horus. Okay. And this is the piece we saw earlier um, Freer, uh, that was photographed in Freer's house. The head and bust of a man, most likely of a pharaoh, um, quite old, around 2000 BCE, made out of limestone. You can see a, a really kind of lovely surface um, um, texture there. Um, Freer was very excited about this piece, although Interestingly, it proved extremely difficult for him to export it. Um, as many of you know, Mr. Freer was a buy the book guy. He got export permits for the things he purchased. Um, and this one proved to be quite difficult to accomplish that, but he did. He writes in his notes that he wanted to compare this piece to the Chinese and Japanese paintings and sculptors in his collection. He wrote, I think it may surpass both, but I'm not sure. Study alone can convince me. But perhaps Freer's most important purchase during this first visit was a very unexpected one, and one that is sometimes described as uncharacteristically impulsive. As we've seen just in this this uh, this tour tonight, Freer was pretty meticulous, <laughs> and this was a purchase he made. Uh, the decision he made in the course of pretty much it looks like a day or a few days. So let's look at Freer's acquisition of some very important biblical manuscripts. So we saw earlier in the photograph of him, he's seated with a. a, a antiquities dealer named Ali Arabi. Um, and Freer was offered during his visit to, um, to this dealer, he was offered what he was told were ancient biblical manuscripts. After consulting with local Greek scholars, he made the purchase, even though there's some evidence that he doubted their authenticity. Uh, they were real. <laughs> and of the manuscripts, one of the most important is a codex or bound book, which contains the four gospels in one volume with these painted covers. Um, the covers are later, 7th century, um, but they show the order of the gospels in the book. Um, with Matthew and John and Mark and Luke. The uh, Codex is now variously known as the Washington Codex or the Freer Gospels. Um, it has been, it is considered, I think it's the third oldest biblical manuscript in the world. Uh, and certainly the oldest currently in the United States. Um, codexes uh, were, were new in this time. Previously, biblical manuscripts were on uh, scrolls. Uh, so this was a relatively new technique to bind the, uh, the, the manuscript. Um, and you can see it's written in Greek. It's like a, a, they're very regular, small, sloping red letters. There's one column per page, 30 lines to a page, 372 written pages, as you'll see, on 187 leaves. Um, 
It's been dated to the late 4th, early 5th century, so the late 300s, early 400s. Its very careful layout suggests that it was possibly for public reading, liturgical reading as part of a, 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 ser a service, or, but it seems to have been compiled from a number of different and fragmentary sources. Now, this is perhaps because the dating of this to the late 4th century, in Christianity was only recognized as a uh, what's the word, legal, <laughs> legitimate religion in 313 by the, Byzantine Emperor, by the Byzantine Emperor Constantine. So before that, Christian books were burned. And uh, so right now at this time, when this was compiled, perhaps the scribes were piecing together what they could find. We don't really know. Uh, the Codex, uh, and in particular the Gospel of Mark, contains a passage known as the Freer Logion, and it's a paragraph not found in any other early version of the Gospels. And it's a brief dialogue at the end of chapter 16 in Mark's Gospels, um, where there's a dialogue between the resurrected Jesus and his disciples. It's fairly short. Um, there, the, the account of this discussion between Jesus and his disciples is referenced in um, the works of St. Jerome. So there is uh, some, um, it, it, we know it's not just out there on its own. Um, so it, it really is an alternative ending to Mark's gospel. Again, unique to uh, the Codex, to the Freer Codex. He also purchased from Ali al Arabi at the time some fragments of the Psalms, which you see are in here is not in as good of condition, um, and 102 leaves of the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua, also in Greek. Um, now, as I said, Freer was. Uh, not entirely sure of the authenticity of these, uh, these documents. So when he returned to Detroit, he contacted a good friend and colleague of his at the University of Michigan, Dr. Francis Kelsey, shown here in the photograph on the left. Many of you uh, who've been to the University of Michigan uh, recently may know him from the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology. Um, Freer enlisted Kelsey upon his return in 1907 to authenticate and then to translate and publish the manuscripts. Uh, Kelsey recommended one of his colleagues, a Greek expert named Henry Sanders, um, a young scholar to work on the manuscripts and their records of Saunders visiting Detroit and Freer House to examine the manuscripts. In, de in December 1907, Sanders delivered to what we are told was great excitement, an academic paper outlining what Freer had acquired. It was considered a tremendous find. Freer went on to support financially and psychically <laughs> the publication and dissemination of the manuscripts, support which he continued through to the end of his life. Freer, among, uh, I'm sorry, Kelsey, among others, urged Freer, after he had a chance to look at the totality of these amazing documents that Freer had brought back, Kelsey urged him to return to Egypt to seek out more. Perhaps they came from a ruins of a monastic library. Uh, as some of you may know, what is considered one of the world's oldest codexes uh, comes from the Monastery of St. Catharines in Egypt's Sinai Desert. And the St. Catherine's Monastery does contain one of the largest collections of ancient manuscripts in the world. So could perhaps Ali al Arabi have found another great library like St. Catherine's? Perhaps there were more fragments, parchments to, uh, to find. So Freer returned to Egypt with a bit of a different purpose and mission, this time particularly focused on the manuscripts. His second trip in 1908 was a short one. No tourism was involved. He was specifically coming to see um, 
Ali Arabi and to see what he could learn about the manuscripts. He did uh, uh, get this, uh, purchase this beautiful manuscript stand um, during this visit. And um, to the best he could ascertain from Ali, um, Arabi and um, Ali's source, the documents appear to be associated with a um, monastery in the Fayum area of Egypt. Um, it doesn't, it didn't appear to be an existing manus, uh, monastery and um, although you'll see more uh, fragments were produced, um, Freer didn't have a huge amount of success in discovering the site. Um, but these other manuscripts are associated, we assume, with the same area as well. So Freer did purchase some additional um, items during this trip. They're interesting because they're written in Coptic, the early language of Egypt. Um, and this is a small portion of the Gospel of Matthew in Coptic, as is this Psalmter. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. There's much more, we have much greater quantities of that 126 fragmentary leaf. And interestingly, the um, Gospel of Matthew is on parchment and the Psalmter is on vellum, on animal skin. So uh, two different, completely different uh, mediums. He also purchased on this trip uh, fragments from the Cairo Geniza. Now, Geniza in Hebrew uh, means safekeeping or hiding. Um, the Cairo Geniza is a very famous storage area uh, associated with um, a synagogue in Cairo, the Ben Ezra Synagogue. Um, from the city's Jewish community. At one point, uh, there was a huge document find, like literally in the area of 300,000 fragments from this storage area. Um, and as you know, um, Jesus uh, was, after he fled um, Palestine, he lived as a child in Egypt. Um, it was, there was a, was a very important and thriving community, a Jewish community in Egypt through the 19th and 20th centuries. So um, this, these fragments from the Geniza are, were extremely important. Uh, the Freer fragments are interesting because they're written in a, a yet another language. This is called Judeo-Arabic, uh, which is a combination of Hebrew, Arabic, and Aramaic, which is, some, is considered by some to be the language of Jesus. It was the primary spoken language, Judeo-Arabic, of much of the Jewish community in the Middle East at the time, and honestly into the 19th and 20th century. It's Arabic words written in um, Hebrew, uh, is, a, is a real simple way of describing it. So this is an interesting uh, uh, purchase that he made during this trip as well. He also bought during this brief 1908 trip, these carved limestone release, reliefs. You remember we talked about Henry Wallace earlier who discussed how, uh, he discussed in his book that fans was used to illustrate architectural tiles. Um, we can, I can think, I can posit that perhaps Freer was motivated by Wallace's comments yet again in purchasing these items. Perhaps they at one point had had a fans glaze or color, um, or they were also possibly used as sculptor's modes. So during his last trip in 1909, Freer made the, uh, an important purchase of an entire glass collection of an Italian man named Giovanni Datari. The this is the, one of the collection I mentioned to you that cons consists of 1,388 glass objects, some very small pieces like the one you see, and also some magnificent vessels. Freer actually wanted the entire collection. He loved the diversity, and it was believed it was important to study all the objects to purchase all the objects so we could study, like I said, as with the, frag, the fragments and the shards, the composition and technical structure, because he really hoped that the study would inform us not only about the craft, tradesmanship, materials used, but also about cultural and, tech, and technical exchanges 
and perhaps um, help us illuminate the history of the region. Here are three of the more magnificent pieces in Datari's collection. Uh, these are glass. The one on the left is pomegranate, again, a very auspicious pomegranate rebirth, um, fertility, very auspicious uh, symbol. The one in the middle and the one on the left are really lovely, aren't they? They're made in something called a dragged thread decoration. That's the color that's pulled through the object. Um, the technology for the making of glass seems to have arrived in Egypt from Syria around 1500 BCE. And it was quickly developed into a craft used in royal workshops. We think these items were definitely part of a royal collection. Um, the technology became really sophisticated. Um, and this is uh, an interest, these are interesting pieces because they're called core formed glass. In other words, they have a core uh, of sand, clay, and mud around which molten glass is, um, is, is, what's the right word? Applied, I think is the right word. <laughs> so they were pulled into the decoration. It was really highly skilled. Um, so He particularly liked these items like these two small fragments and shards. This item on the left shows us that it's from the early Bronze Age and it's, and it's um, uh, from Syria or Mesopotamia. So it shows us there was trade and exchange between the two areas and that there were um, lovely glass pieces produced in Syria as well as in Egypt. And then of course we have this lovely a very small fragment of Anubis, the important god of mummification. He did purchase two more pieces of uh, his uh, lovely bowls. Um, similar motif on this bowl on the left of the lotuses and the fish. And this one on the right is a, a very important goddess known as Hathor, who is the goddess of the sky, women, and fertility. This small container is stunning, isn't it? Um, and it is also one of the oldest pieces in our collection. It dates to around 2600 BCE, so 4,600 uh, years ago. Uh, isn't it lovely? It's amethyst quartz uh, made in the Old Kingdom, which is uh, probably around the time uh, of the pyramids. It's, uh, it's a very nice item, is it? It probably would have had a stopper um, the ancient Egyptians were quite, there's, there's granite, there's alabaster, there's quartz, and they were quite accomplished at making vessels um, in those materials. But I think this one is really pretty. Oops, sorry. Uh, he also purchased this interesting Byzantine uh, jewelry collection. Uh, this has a coin showing uh, one of the Byzantine emperors dates to the 500s. But he also uh, was starting freer on this last trip, becoming increasingly frustrated with uh, the mechanics of purchasing and exporting items from Egypt. For one, there was a lot of competition. As many of you know, people like JP Morgan um, and others were traveling to Egypt. And um, so there was a lot of competition in the market. Um, two, as I mentioned, he was having increasing trouble getting things exported. Um, and three, <laughs> and these three objects on the screen were uh, one of the uh, areas which very much upset him, forgeries or quote unquote, modern reproductions were very common. These three items were found among the uh, items Freer purchased in his last visit, 1909. He was told that, you know, they were uh, authentic and uh, once he returned home, discovered they weren't. And also at the same time, he realized that um, the markets for Chinese and Japanese items were not as popular 
many items were coming on the market, and he sh sort of shifted his coll collecting focus from Egypt at the time. Um, he did, uh, in the years from 1909 until his death 10 years later, continue to support um, and collect additional uh, manuscript fragments uh, like these on the screen here. These are from the Roman period. So you can see there's a mid third century. These are uh, quite old. Uh, he, these were acquired, as you can see, in 1916. And interestingly, he, um, Freer, and the J.P. Morgan Library split this collection. Uh, the Greek discoveries that you see here came to the Freer Gallery, and the Coptic are in the J.P. Morgan Library. And after Freer's death in the 1930s, we did we were able to acquire what I think I think is a piece he would really love, a very special piece. Again, you can see the date 2600 BCE. This is a head of a pharaoh um, made from stone and copper. Very smooth, beautiful texture surface, right? Um, it's in remarkably good condition. It has an ear chipped off. It's lost. The pharaoh has lost his beard. The right eyeball is missing, but it is a beautiful piece. Um, the details of the crown suggest it was probably carved in the fourth or fifth dynasty. And very few royal stat statues we saw survived from these periods, making a, a rare, rare example of Egyptian royal portraiture. So even though we acquired this after his death, I think he'd be very happy with it my personal opinion. Um, and even though, as I mentioned, he was focused elsewhere, he did continue to support, and I mean support, both psychic uh, enthusiasm and financial, uh, the translation of the manuscripts. Um, Kelsey uh, records that Freer took an enthusiastic interest in the work um, and generally and insisted that Sanders, Kelsey, and those working on the manuscript use the most advanced technology in the photographic processes so scholars could have clear images of the manuscript and be able to analyze. He financed the publishing and dissemination of this project. And this last volume, you'll see, was completed after his death in uh, 1927. And even though his collecting interests shifted elsewhere, he continued to support Mary Chase Perry and her Puavic Pottery Group. This is a photograph um, I found of the fireplace. I don't think you're sitting there, William, right? You said it's in another room, but that Freer, Freer commissioned for Freer House in uh, 1911. And Mary Chase Perry's records and Freer's records say this was an Egyptian blue tiled fireplace. Um, this photograph and the next photograph was made in Freer House in 1908. And it shows how Freer displayed his ceramic wares, some of which we've seen this evening as, on our uh, look at Freer in the Peacock Room when it was uh, in Freer House. Um, I think uh, these pictures, as photographs as you can see are from 1908. I think William and I found one or two uh, Egyptian vases, perhaps this one on the wall here, but they were part of his collection um, that he displayed in the Peacock Room. And we know uh, this is the photograph we saw at the beginning uh, that he prominently displayed his Egyptian pieces with his other acquisitions. Uh, we discussed that he placed this with a jar from Rakha. And we've created this arrangement in one of our galleries in the Freer. This is a photograph I took last week <laughs> in our galleries. And you can see how the two of these together don't they have a beautiful texture and very similar and complementary uh, features. 
It's in an exhibit we have in the Freer Now on the power to see beauty. And in the same series of photographs taken by Co Coburn in Freer House, here is Freer with two Egyptian statues flanking a Whistler, Whistler pastel. Anne Gunther, uh, a former curator at the Freer, Freer, who's chronicled his time in Egypt for a wonderful book called A Collector's Journey, says that this arrangement and the portrait expresses Freer's view that Whistler was the center of everything to him, was the heir to ancient Egypt, which he thought was the greatest art in the world. Here are the three objects that were, Freer had arranged. Um, this is Anubis, um, the god of the afterlife. Neth, protectress of humankind, flanking in bronze, by the way, flanking this beautiful Whistler pastel. Again, similar shapes, uh, similar shades, um, very uh, complementary, certainly. Uh, in, in Freer's mind. There's a quote from Whistler that Freer embraced and that's shown in the previous Porter's photos that I think is borne out in Freer's collecting philosophy. The story of the beautiful is already complete. It's seen in the marbles of the Parthenons, in the sky with the birds, and upon the fion of Hawkesai. At the Freer today, we continue to try and honor Mr. Freer's vision by showing things as he would have wanted them shown. I close with this photo of the Peacock Room, uh, which was made a few years ago when it was set up with the same arrangement as in Freer's house in Detroit. And it was made on a day when the shutters are open. As most of you know, we only do that once a month. <laughs> um, so it's wonderful to see Whistler's great composition here, made in a dining room in London, brought to Detroit and then Washington by Freer, and which he used as the showcase for so many items in his collection. To me, it's the perfect representation of his artistic vision, a vision with Whistler at the center of a harmonious whole in a connected series. And I have to say, each time I enter this room, I'm reminded of Freer's adage, for those with the power to see beauty, all works of art go together, whatever their period. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to show you, any of you, and I will share this with uh, Cheryl and William. Uh, if you're interested in any of the references and some of the things we've talked about tonight, I've compiled, compiled a, a screen of that. Um, and I just want to thank you very much for indulging me and for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Gretchen. That was extraordinary, really. I learned so much. Uh, I, I cannot thank you enough. That was, I want to watch the whole thing again. It was phenomenal. Do we have questions? We're open for questions now. Yes, I apologize. I've probably got into many people's dinner hours. So <laughs> I don't think they mind at all. Um, and I, I did want to mention while people are thinking of um, putting questions in the chat box, we did have participants from Bristol, UK, Sarasota, Florida, Salisbury in the UK, Sandwich in the UK, Virginia, Wales, Montreal, Ontario, um, from all over the nation and the world. So that's really remarkable. Um, I see there's a note in the chat about one of the photos in Luxor. This, in fact, Edfu in the Valley of the Kings. Um, so thank you for the correction. I think it's from Dean Hilton. I appreciate that. <laughs> and I'm, we'll make that note. I want to point out while we're waiting for if anyone has any questions, we're very excited to um, that in our centennial year, hopefully with COVID, things are a little uh, you never know, right? We're hoping to have an exhibit of Freer in Egypt in the Freer. Um, so if you're visiting us, um, and I'm not sure when it begins, but please check our website and please come in and see some of these uh, beautiful items in person. Did you see the note from Michael? Mm. If you have a reference for the 
Yes, okay, I see that. I'm gonna make a note of that and I will do that, Michael. Gretchen, may I pop in for a second? Of course. Uh, your tour was a tour de force. Thank you so much. Fascinating, uh, delightful and informative. And thanks for weaving in uh, the Freer House in Detroit as part of the journey. And I just wanna to bring to your attention, there was a very early question from uh, Nadine Delery in Montreal regarding uh, whether there's any concern about the uh, provenance, not necessarily the provenance of the Egyptian objects, but um, the um, legitimacy and legality of their acquisition um, and any risk of repatriation or concerns around that. Um, that's a great question. I know we have a provenance group right now um, working on various things at the Freer. And there may be someone with a lot more knowledge than I, but to the best of my knowledge, because Freer kept such detailed notes and we have such clear provenance with him, and because in the case of these Egyptian objects, he was quite scrupulous about acquiring legal export permits. Um, I, to the best of my knowledge, there have not been any um, issues with provenance or repatriation. But I, um, I, I will have to defer to some of my experts and I'd be happy to, uh, to look at that for you. There is another comment from Diane Hilton. Have you ever thought of talking to the Association for the Study of Travel to Egypt and the Near East? Sounds like a great group. <laughs> We, uh, um, I'd, I'd love, that would be a great group, Mr. Hilton. Um, I go to Egypt, I was just there in October, I go almost every year, because uh, I'm on the board of the American University of Cairo. So, um, love to, We'd, and we'd love to have people come visit. <laughs> well, they, they have um, a conference coming up in May in, in the UK. Oh, great. Sorry. It, 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 you, you say your name, Diane? Diane? Diane. Oh, Diane. For, sorry, Diane. Of course. That's, I was that's looking right. at, and I apologize for calling you Mr. Oh, really? That's great. Hey, normally I get called Dylan, so you got the name right. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. No, the, the Association of the Study of Travel in Egypt and the Near East, Destini, is this is exactly the sort of thing they would be interesting to in seeing and hearing um, and they might even have information they could pass on to you. Fantastic. Um, if you're able to, uh, let's see, how can I get to, to Diane? I can uh, see, I think I can get you here. Let me just send you a note. Please, we'd be really happy to, uh, to share this. Um, Right, I will do that. Um, and I've probably got some more info, up, up to date information about the gla glass history. Oh, fabulous, really? Uh, yeah, because I teach ancient glass technology. Oh, fantastic. So the latest information is that at the moment, it looks like Egypt is winning the race to actually be the earliest glass. <laughs> not Syria. The te technology not did not Syria come at from the moment. Syria. Ah. They're, they're, they're probably going to try and bat it back to Syria at some stage. But at the moment, it is Egypt. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, did you say you're in Bristol, Diane? Bristol, yes. My gosh, you're up late. Um, uh, yeah, and I have to be up in six hours for work, so yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I won't be staying up much longer, but I, I had to say how fabulous the talk was, absolutely wonderful, really enjoyed it. Thank you so and much. And my husband, who, who is an Egyptologist, found it fascinating as well. Oh my already gosh. Gone to bed. <laughs> He's already gone. Great. Well, thank you, and thank you all for uh, for joining us, and as I said, we offer other programs at 
at the National Museum of Asian Art. And I, so please check our website. Um, and Excuse me, I have said, one we'll, last quick question. Oh, sure, of course. Each month, are the shutters open in the Peacock Room? Oh, uh, the third Thursday, Sue, unless that was the pre-pandemic, and I don't believe we've changed that. I don't, are my name my docent colleagues on? Rue, do you know by chance? It's usually the third Thursday. I don't know after COVID what they are doing now. Sorry. Um, but uh, if, if any of you, you know, one of, I'm a, I, before COVID, I was a Thursday docent, and I actually had a group from Detroit come on the last third Thursday before Mr. Freer's ceramics were taken down because they wanted to see the uh, ceramics on the wall of the peacock room with the windows opening. It's pretty spectacular. Uh -huh. Thank you. You're getting lots of wonderful comments in the chat box about how well, the, everyone. I so enjoyed it. You were just a great group. And I said, I feel uh, Freer, Mr. Freer in Egypt, my favorite things. It's wonderful to talk to you all. And uh, we hope to see you either in Washington or at future programs, either at Freer House or at, uh, at our museum. Thank you so much, Gretchen, and thank you all for joining us. And I think we'll close the program and wish you a good evening. Thank you, Rufan, and thank you, Cheryl.